Very good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the virtual hash cross border learn X network session. So um, just some instructions for you guys Do mute yourself at all times. There will be opportunity for you to speak, to ask questions and to network later. And do rename yourself if you haven't your name, your trade and the country so that uh, we are able to identify you. And also third prepare your 30 seconds introductory pitch as you get to introduce yourself shortly so prepare um, some of these information like your name your company your trade countries of interest for expansion or who you would like to connect with and what you hope to get out of today's session okay very good afternoon everyone hope you're having a great uh, day today so a little bit about myself. So I'm the uh, MD of hashtags. Um, here's my bio. So basically, um, I'll be sharing more information about what we do as a company. And um, I also do um, have another brand, which is HR Entrepreneur, an inclusive and diverse regional omnichannel media platform as well that connects an ecosystem of entrepreneurs, leaders, government and investors across Asia. And uh, we hold these uh, regular LearnX Network sessions and summits and conferences together, industry leaders every year. And now that with um, the pandemic, we can't really meet. So therefore, most of our sessions are virtual. Okay, so um, this is a little bit about myself. If you'd like to connect, um, let's connect on LinkedIn. Okay, so um, it is pretty much your turn. All right, um, I get. Uh, each and every one of you to briefly introduce yourself before we start this session proper. Um, your name, company trade, the countries you'd like to expand to, who you'd like to connect with, and what you'd like to get out of today's session. Okay, so there are more people coming in. Uh, let's admit them. Okay. Right. Who would like to go first? I guess um, the speakers will be introduced later. So uh, the rest of you um, will get you to introduce yourself. Um, you could uh, switch on your audio as well as your video. Okay, we'll go in sweet sequence. Um, I see some people here already with your videos on. So I'll give you the priority. Okay, so let's have, um, okay, some of you just <laughs> switch up your video don't be shy don't be shy okay let's have um sandy sandy hi how are you tell us um about yourself Hello. yep hey hi everyone yeah i'm sandy from hong kong and then my factory is located in china and then i'm working for uh packaging uh something like the best and then the best can be a, a cosmetic bag tote bag or even backpack yeah mm. so and then i'm looking for uh someone they need to develop their brand and then for gwp give with purchase yeah that's mm. all thank you okay thank you so much she's from hong kong great yeah. um next shall we have zaha zahari yeah hold on gotta unmute okay hi zaha all right hi hi Rene. thank you so much uh i'm zaha I'm actually from Anikuto Osman, Indonesia. We are in modest fashion ready to wear mm -hmm. uh, in Indonesia, local brand from Bandung. Okay. Uh, I'm here uh, because I want to connect with uh, fashion retail in Singapore and Hong Kong. So we hope we can find a way to be present in Singapore and Hong Kong. Thank you. Mm, I see. Thank you. All right. Um, Vincent Ho. Hi, introduce yourself, where you're from, and who you'd like to connect with, and what you hope to get out of today's session. Yeah, yeah uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Vincent Ho. We are from uh, Corporate Oran, Malaysia. We are a corporate services provider, uh, help, helping companies in company incorporations, uh, payroll, accounting, taxation, and uh, auditing in Malaysia. We have been practice for the past 20 years and looking forward to welcome more company to incorporate your businesses in Malaysia. Okay. Thank you. How about Jesslyn Bay? Hi, I'm Jesslyn. Uh, I'm actually based in Singapore. So I'm actually a skiller in, uh, it's basically in 
in, in book is called a uh, consultant, uh, business consultant uh, who help businesses to scale in Southeast Asia, uh, mainly uh, Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand. Uh, we also have office in Taiwan, so we may have some clients coming from Taiwan, uh, coming to this region. So sometimes I may need, you know, to, to know other people so that we can do some matching, uh, business matching, partnership matching, things like that. Yeah. Nice Thank to you. meet everyone today. Great to see you. And next, can we have Marie? Hi. Hi, everyone. I'm Marie. The... I'm the founder of uh, my last concept. is a loan specialist industry uh, for 12 years. And I'm stationed in Singapore, tying up with all the panels, banks, and financial institutions. And I also run a corporate secretary service, which tied up with all the uh, SMEs to run their accounting. The, uh, the country that I want to connect to is actually China, Malaysia, and India to look for FMB um, to tie on or to look for the uh, IT industries. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Can we have uh, Iskandar Sharil? Hey, hi, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Iskandar from Singapore. Uh, recently, I launched this uh, AI virtual based uh, fitness workout. Uh, it's called CampTai.com. Actually, if you go to my participant name list, uh, I've listed the, uh, the uh, what do you call it, the website over there. Uh, I've got the rights right now to market it to ASEAN. So I've seen, I mean, I've seen some people from Myanmar and Malaysia and all that. So I've been just keen to, 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 to expand to those markets. Thank you. Thank you so much. And can we have Clement? Clement, introduce yourself and where you're from and who, whom you'd like to connect with. Yeah. Okay, uh, we'll move on. Yeah, Clement? Yes, sorry about that. Um, I'm doing finance and asset management and immigration, uh, which is asset management is like corporate bond. But I have another major business stream is immigration. I really want to get in expansion of Malaysia and Singapore and introducing business immigration to the Malaysia or Singapore. I'm looking for something like a franchise broker that can make the business that can have uh, Hong Kong people to invest in Malaysia or Singapore. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Clement. And we have Karian. Those of you who want to introduce yourself, please um, on your video and uh, yeah. Hi, Karian. Okay, you gotta unmute yourself. Unmute. Yeah. Hi, can you hear me all right? Yes, perfect. Hi, yes, um, I'm Karian, I'm from Singapore. Um, we have a company here, it's an alternative wellness um, retail company and we are looking to expand into other regions so um, it would be helpful to connect with people who are well versed in um, their area and um, hoping to connect that way. All right thank you. Can we have Gilbert? Introduce yourself where you're from who you like to be with. Yeah. Uh, can everyone hear? Yes. Okay, uh, okay, now uh, my name is Gilbert. Uh, we based uh, basically in the audiovisual uh, industry and uh, uh, specifically we manufacture projection screens to be exported uh, globally. And uh, myself, I'm in charge of the South Asia uh, re region. And uh, I, because of the pan pandemic, uh, things seem to have uh, stopped. Uh, completely, and uh, I hope uh, we can get some insights from uh, from the the webinar here. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, thank you. Okay, so for the rest who like to introduce yourself, please show up uh, on your video. Um, Diane Ha. Hi. And I am a startup consultant. I am a Malaysian, but living in Kenya at the moment, looking to move back to Malaysia. Uh, so just interested to know and, you know, about what's going on, um, uh, whether it's in Singapore, Malaysia, or, or Southeast Asia in general. Okay. How about Eunice from CAS? Hey guys, uh, my name's Eunice. I work with CAS. Uh, we are an intellectual property firm with offices in Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, Myanmar, Thailand, and Vietnam. And we're looking into expanding to Philippines. 
Um, I'm, I'm Malaysian as well, and I, um, I'm based in Myanmar right now. I'm looking forward to the session. Oh, I also have Gita as my colleague here, and uh, Vijay and uh, Win, who is also from Myanmar, joining the session as well. Thanks. Okay, fantastic. All right. Thank you. Okay, anyone else would like to introduce yourself, please, on your video and join us here? Yeah. Okay. Um, can you Win. hear me? Yes. Yeah, Win. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm based in Myanmar. I'm. Uh, I'm from also, also from Kes. Yeah, the same with Eunice. Okay, great. Thank yeah, you. the same with Gida and PJ also. Yeah, I, I'm based in Myanmar, and uh, we are looking for expand uh, IP services in Myanmar, intellectual property services in Myanmar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. All right. Anyone else would like to introduce yourself? If not, I guess you'll be too, you're, you're too shy. Then definitely there will be an opportunity uh, for you to be, you know, in smaller groups later in the breakout session. Okay. So if not, then, you know, we'll move on to um, our segment. Okay. All right. Okay. So um, later on, you'll still get to introduce yourselves for those who have not uh, gotten a chance. You'll be placed in separate rooms as well, um, or we could do this after uh, the session. Okay. Okay, let's move on. So a little bit about us, about hashtags. So we harness business um, brand and digital transformation. So we uplift bus businesses in a few key areas from internationalization, brand transformation and marketing advisory and implementation and digital transformation. So in terms of internationalization programs, what do we do? So we're planning for uh, some of the business mission trips across Asia. I think that's gonna happen most probably 2021. And uh, with these uh, opportunities, you're able to hop on and these are partially funded. Um, and you could also uh, join us in the Deal Hunter programs after the mission trips for dedicated one-to-one -one business matching. And there would be funding support available for Singapore local businesses for overseas expansion. So for those of you who have questions on this, uh, feel free to drop us a note after this. Okay, so in terms of brand transformation and marketing, so we focus a lot on omni-channel marketing strategies, focusing on both online and offline multi-channel uh, marketing and branding. And there's also funding support for Singaporean local SMEs of up to 80%, that's up to December, 2020. Okay, for more information, um, do reach out to us. So you might be wondering what is the purpose of the LearnX Network session? So basically um, it is to educate the business community in functional business strategies. So we have done so in the last season. Right now, um, we are actually conducting these cross-border LearnX Network sessions so that people from various countries can come together, uh, learn and network. And there could be potential opportunities for collaboration, and for you guys to work together. So at the end of the day, we want to create a community of industry leaders and business owners to network and forge partnerships. And of course, to inspire the entire community through learning from successful businesses as well. So some of the past events and activities that we've done uh, includes the June uh, virtual Hash Asia Summit. Some of you were familiar with this, where uh, we had attendees mainly from Singapore and Malaysia, and this was done virtually in, in case you're wondering, oh, is it done in Zoom? No, it's actually on a platform. So there are also live um, Q&A sessions and also networking sessions where you are randomly assigned um, to speed network with people. Um, if you think you have missed the chance and you'd like to experience this, we have an event upcoming in September in which you could join us as well. So these were previously held sessions, virtual summits, a monthly LearnX network. I mean, these we got to wait for uh, perhaps up till October at least um, before we resume some of the um, activities. Okay, so these are just some of the um, cozy sessions and also some of the summits that uh, we have put together for the past three years. And it's a regional network um, which you could tap on in some of our sessions in Singapore and also in Malaysia. These are some of the C-suites, founders of notable brands, the government and investors as well. Just some examples. So, you know, uh, we even held a master classes. So uh, these are very inclusive and diverse community um, of people. Okay. 
some of the highlights. It's a very diverse one. Um, but the whole purpose, if you look at the branding, is to attract more female founders to want to get to um, a business session. And this is upcoming, a virtual HR Global Innovation Festival 2020 that's happening 21st to 26th of June. It's a hybrid event, uh, but with learning and some speed networking done online with offline high tea networking session as well with international and local speakers. Okay, so I'd like to introduce our first guest speaker of today, Geeta Kandia, the director of CAS International Southeast Asia. So a little bit about her. Well, she's one of the leading IP experts in Malaysia with 16 years of experience in this field. So she frequently shares her IP expertise on various media platforms with contributed articles in various publications as well. And, um, you know, her publications are also featured um, in, in magazines. And um, she has been recognized for her exceptional work in the IP field by Prestige Magazine in 2010, where she made it into the top 10 of Malaysia's top 40 under 40. And Gita is highly sought after international speaker, has been invited to speak at several engagements and conferences in various regions like Japan, Taipei, Ahmedabad, and more. Let's uh, put our hands together and welcome Gita. Hi, Gita. Hi, Renee. Thank you for that lovely introduction. And hello to everyone, all the participants, for joining us this afternoon or this evening. Um, so I'm going to share my screen now. Right. Okay, so I'm going to get started. Uh, so thanks, Vinay. Firstly, for hashtags for welcoming us on this forum. We're very excited for two reasons. One is we are always exposed to companies that have brands and services and products that they want to go abroad. Um, not, they're not just looking at their own jurisdiction. They're looking at taking that brand of theirs and exploring other jurisdictions. Um, so for that reason, uh, our experience is pretty much advising clients like you all the time, uh, companies like all of you that are joining in. Also, we come from a basis of we have gone through that pain as well. We've gone through the struggles and the challenges of taking cash to other countries. Our headquarters is in Malaysia, and as my colleague Eunice said, we are in other ASEAN countries now. So what are you going to learn from us? It's also from our own experience. So let's get started. CAS has been around for 21 years, uh, and we are a group of lawyers and a group of engineers um, who help to protect anything to do with intellectual property rights and also give sessions like this where we educate all of you. We're known in the industry. Uh, we got a, one of the top leading IP firms by foreign companies. Okay, so the warning here is that um, there are some parts, examples and case studies that might be uh, vulgar, offensive, or sexual, so please don't take offense, offense on it and just it's all on a learning uh, basis. So first, when venturing overseas, what does one even consider? I heard from many of you during the introduction, thanks for your introduction, and a lot of you are looking at going to Taiwan, China, many are looking at Southeast Asia. So let's look at what considerations must you look at when you're venturing overseas. The six main considerations. The six main considerations are AYR, I'll come to that shortly. You'll be wondering what is AYR? Why is that the first thing? Second is market considerations. Third is investment and capital. Next is language and cultural dif differences. Then you have dedication and commitment and rules and regulation. So the one thing that I'll be talking about in depth is rules and regulation. I'll be talking about intellectual property rights and taking your brands overseas, what are the challenges you're going to face. But let's quickly delve into this because many of you are looking at expanding. AYI is, AYR is pretty much, are you ready? What we find is a lot of business owners have the dream. They want to go abroad, but they might not have the mindset and the dedication that comes with going abroad. So this is a, a quote that says that it's not companies that go global, people do. And that's the main thing when going abroad. Are you ready? Do you, are you mentally ready to go abroad? Market considerations is the suitability of your product in the market and the demand for it in that specific market. Very, very important. Uh, 
your, are your products or similar type of products available already in that market for cheaper? If they're priced at a lower market per entry point, what is different about your product? So all of this needs to be considered. Uh, for example, CAS, before we entered Myanmar, we did a research study uh, where we had a group of a team put into together what are other IP firms, intellectual property firms charging in Myanmar, what is different that we can provide to existing firms in Myanmar, where should we be located, uh, and so on. How should we start, uh, present our marketing strategy? So we did a report look at, looking at market analysis before entering. So analyze your products in the market, uh, including your marketing strategy and pricing of your products. Then is investment in capital. How much do you need? And not just how much do you need to enter the market, how much do you need to sustain for the first year? Uh, where is the funds going to go to? So analyzing your investment in the country, language and cultural differences as well. So you need to look at your team. Will you be sending someone from Singapore if you're based in Singapore, if you're based in Hong Kong or in Malaysia? Will you be sending someone there so that you maintain the corporate culture so that they can train the rest of the team? Uh, are you looking at special marketing and branding messages to the others? And understanding business trends there as well, because they're all very different due to the language and cultural differences. Five is similar to number one. It's not easy, so there must be dedication and commitment, not just from the leader, it must be dedication commitment from the team, from the leadership team or the management team. Uh, and these are the areas that you'll be looking at. And then it comes to what I'm going to talk about and the examples I'll give. There are many rules and regulations important. Every industry is different. Earlier, Sandy was saying that she's looking at exporting bags and expanding bags in the GW. P uh, area. And then Zaha, Zahari, you're talking about couture clothes uh, and looking at that. Um, you're from Bandung and you're looking at connecting to fashion market in Hong Kong and Singapore. See that all these different types of products have different laws depending on the products. Medical products, for example, need to meet other requirements. Food products need to meet labeling requirements. So there's specific laws sometimes for the specific goods. So where I'm tapping into now is from the experience of intellectual property rights and, and the things that you need to look at in terms of intellectual property rights when you're going abroad. So let's look at obstacles, oversights and mistakes made by other parties because that's the best way to learn. We don't want to make these mistakes. So let's see what they did and how can we learn from them. In the first case study I have uh, is a, in a new market, um, a party enters a new market with a new product. And they receive a legal letter alleging that the trademark and has been infringed and the design. This was for a drink, it was for a beverage. Um, and that beverage, when our client launched it into another market, they received a cease and desist letter. The trademark was almost identical to an existing trademark. And there was design of the bottle of the beverage in which the beverage was sold was similar to an existing design as well. So with that legal letter, they came asking us for advice uh, and our client actually had to rebrand and change the design of the bottle for that market because there was infringement. So how do they avoid such obstacles in the future? How do you avoid if you're ex exporting your products to another country? You need to conduct clearance searches. So this is one of a very common thing many companies do when they are venturing abroad because there's a high level of risk when you are venturing abroad. And the last thing you want, you know, earlier we said about how, hey, do a market uh, research, market analysis research. So there's a lot of things that you do to prepare yourself and you prepare yourself mentally as well. All right, I'm ready for the challenge. All of you are amazing, by the way, because you're looking at beyond your current shores. And the fact that it is challenging. So you've kind of prepared yourself to get into the market, but then you get a cease and desist letter, which totally puts a uh, obstacle into your whole journey, uh, puts a kind of like spanner in the works. And that's when it gets really difficult. So all of this can be avoided by doing clearance searches. And this would be design searches, trademark searches to identify is your brand, is your design or is your technology encroaching on someone else's design uh, brand or technology. In my next case study is a brand, a, pro, a brand enters a new market and the market responds poorly. This brand is lip baby for some, lip 
Barbie for some, uh, and it's for lipsticks. So for the Indonesians and the Malaysians here might understand, and the Singaporeans who understand Malay will also understand, uh, is Barbie in the Malay language means pig. So in the lip, babe, what it was intended was actually a baby being um, made fanciful with a different spelling for baby, uh, B-A-B-I, but when brought to our shores, uh, unfortunately that word actually means something in the Malay language. So can you imagine why the market responded poorly? Because 60% of our population are Muslim. So it's not even a matter of trademarks or can it be registered as a trademark because it's offensive. Even then there will be objections by the intellectual property office in Malaysia and in Indonesia. It's a question of can you overcome the objections? So that's one thing in terms of the legal part of it. But in terms of marketing and product acceptance, that itself becomes a negative element here. And it's very hard to then change the perception of the population. So this is a very dangerous thing. I'll give you more examples. How to avoid such obstacles in the future? Well, it's very important to ensure that clearance searches are done, including linguistic checks. So earlier I was saying, yeah, make sure you do clearance searches, ensure that you're not trespassing on other brands, other people's uh, trademarks, but it's also important to do linguistic checks to find out what does your brand mean in another marketplace. There are many cases of uh, things going wrong. So that's an example, the lip barbie. Uh, in, in one country as well, Ford had a brand which meant a male genital fought for their cars. And when they launched it, they immediately realized their mistakes, their mistake and sales were really low. So they had to rebrand their motor vehicles to a different brand. So a company as big as Ford could make that mistake. Uh, it's very important that us SMEs in the marketplace don't make that mistake because it becomes a very expensive correction during the course of business. I don't know that any of you have seen this car. If you do, then just type it, uh, type the brand in the chat group. Uh, we can make this session interactive, but yeah. Uh, this, this car was introduced in India by Tata Motors. And the brand behind this car is Zika. This brand was introduced right, so, so what happened here was the car was going to be launched and the brand was coined right before a very famous outbreak. If you remember, it was the Zika outbreak uh, in Africa. And that outbreak came smack in the middle before the product was launched, but after the name was coined. And for all those business owners out there who have gone through the trouble of naming your company, naming your service, naming your product, you will all know that so much of thought process goes into that part of naming your product and service. Coming up with a brand, it's not an easy feat. Can you imagine Tata Motors coming up with Zika, which is such a catchy name. It's two syllables, Zika. And then having this problem, I love the way they took this crisis and changed it into an opportunity. So what they did is they went to their dealers. They were actually extremely stressed and said that we're launching in three months. And now what do we do? It's got a negative per per perception on this brand. Uh, and the, one of the dealers gave a very good suggestion and they took it, they took on upon, uh, they took it upon themselves to embark on that suggestion, which was to, Hey, let's make a, social media campaign out of this. Let's ask our fans to name, give us a new brand. And they did it. They put an image of their car, a 3D image of their car on their site, on their Facebook site. They got a lot of fans to give brands and um, let's see how it came about. They came with the brand Tiago. So this brand was at least, was shortlisted for many. Look at that, 37,000 entries were given. Tata received 37,000 entries to social media and SMS over this campaign. And the campaign ran for three days and the prize was the car itself. How cool was that? The way they took this crisis and made it into a huge marketing campaign, uh, they were totally commendable on this effort because the way that the fans had to decide was also to check out the car and think about it. If you're looking at features of a car and exploring a car, if you are thinking of buying a car, 
that's already you experiencing the car. So that was a great marketing effort coming from a crisis that they had, that they had to rebrand. And they, so they changed Zika to Tiago. Now look at a brand for a comb in EU. Its shape of the comb is really unique. It's curvaceous and the brand was Curve O. But this Curve O brand was not allowed in EU. It was refused. And why is that so? Because in Romania, the curve uh, means the curve O means prostitute. So the Intellectual Property, Property Office, which is called the EU IPO, the uh, IP office in Europe, found it offensive and vulgar. So they didn't allow it. So all of this is really important because you can launch a product. And we've seen this happen tons of times. Our clients launch products and then come to us when something goes wrong. Uh, and these are the situations that happen. So clearance searches are super important and linguistic checks. A Spanish trademark for a pizza chain was refused in EU, La Mafia. Let's see why was it refused. The Italian government filed an invalidation action. So in Italy, the Mafia refers to a criminal organ organization. So this is not even a, a third party taking objection. This is the government taking objection. So in EU, it was not allowed to be registered. Then you have trademark for light beer which was accepted after appeal in EU. Look at the brand. I can't even say it. <laughs> I can't even say it on this webinar. But can you see how vulgar and offensive it can be? So let's see how come Curve O, which to all of us here in ASEAN market, will be like, what's wrong with Curve O? And then you find that it's offensive in Romania. And then you looked at Zika and we looked at uh, the other brand as well, the other brands earlier. Okay, let's see. Really interesting. The reason it was accepted is because that word could refer to the origin of the beer. There is a town with that name, that vulgar name in Austria. And get this, hell means light beer. So that trademark implies that it's light beer from the town, a specific town. And then the person who was arguing against objection also came about and said that this is how beer is named in Europe. It's, you've got Endershire Hell from Endershire, Turgenshire Hell from Turgenshire. So Hell means light beer and the city is put before the word Hell. So hence, effing Hell can be registered as a trademark. So uh, the European IP office had to allow it because there's so much of basis and rationale behind that. This trademark uh, was a trademark for mascara in Saudi Arabia. Uh, really interesting how this company rebranded. So they saw that there was going to be a lot of problems in uh, a Middle Eastern country that might be more conservative than the Western countries. So Too Faced, uh, the company behind it, rebranded the, the brand from better than sex to better than love to I guess avoid the example that I gave earlier about lip barbie. Uh, it's not everyone's as uh, liberal minded or open minded. So for that reason, it is safer to go with a different brand into that market. So likewise, if you're going abroad, look at your brand and look at the positioning of your brand in those markets and understanding the culture is really important as well. So third case study is Australians uh, were setting up a manufacturing base in Malaysia. And they were providing know-how to a Malaysian company, but they needed a Malaysian company to set up a manufacturing base because the Malaysian company was already a manufacturer. So the Australians came, they didn't want to start a whole entire factory in Malaysia and they tied up. They entered into a joint venture with a local company. So a local manufacturer with know-how from the Australian company. The Australian company also had clients abroad with the clients abroad, they could then manufacture together a local company and sell the products overseas. And the products were to do with um, uh, animal food, uh, pet food. So what is interesting here is what happened after that. The Malaysian company did not want to continue in business with Australians, claiming that it was no profit. They wanted to now liaise directly with the clients. Think about it. They are the manufacturers using know-how from the Australians, but they wanted to now cut out a middleman and deal directly with the end consumers, the consumers who, uh, customers who are mainly from Europe. So they contacted the clients directly and offered lower prices for the products. 
So what could have prevented this? This is where intellectual property rights come in and give the business owner ammo, kind of like ammo to shoot at people who do them wrong, people who take things that shouldn't belong, doesn't belong to them. So here, what could have prevented this if confidentiality agreement was entered into? Uh, there's many things that were confidential, your client list, pricing strategy, know-how in terms of how the products are manufactured. If the know-how, which is the process of manufacturing the product uh, and the end product can be patented, meaning the technology is protected by patent, then they could also sue on that basis. Trademarks, the brands are fixed on the product. Um, if that's been secured, you can sue them for trademark infringement. Design, if the product, the way the packaging is designed is specific and, and special type of design, can also sue them in terms of design rights. So this is where there's multi-layer of angles of intellectual property rights that can prevent the happening of this relationship. So uh, we had to advise them on various angles. The, the trademark and design were not copied, but confidential information was used. So there was breach of confidential information in this case. Case study four is um, an, a problem that happened in Indonesia. This was a distributor decided to continue selling the products even after the distributorship agreement is terminated. This was a local client in Malaysia who was exporting products to Indonesia. And really interesting and, and shocking when our client, which is okay, so you're looking at the client, uh, they were selling con construction products uh, and it was branded construction products. He had fixed his own brands on the construction products and he was selling it in Indonesia, but the relationship turned sour as some relationships do. And in accordance with the distributorship agreement, in, with, in accordance with the terms of the agreement, he terminated that agreement. But his existing distributor, who is now his ex-distributor, continued to sell it. And when he sought a different distributor, when he sought, you can see that on the screen, is it? Are you able to see that, Rene, on the screen? Let me try yes. to. Yeah, you have that um, throughout. Yeah. Oh, Until it sometime it, it will re it will go away after some time. Okay, let me move it. How do I move it? Yeah, I think it's okay because it will disappear on its own if you yeah. no, there must be a way to move it. Okay, never mind. I okay, wait, wait. Maybe there is this. <laughs> that better. Eh? Okay, never mind. I'm trying to figure out how to get that away, but all right, so let's yeah, let's not take up time. So sorry everyone for this technical function. I can't seem to figure it out. All right, so never mind. Um, so yes, so back to this, yeah. So uh, really interesting and really upsetting for a client was when, he, so he appointed a different distributor. He appointed a different distributor and uh, continued business as usual because your ex-distributor has bad relationship. You are still the manufacturer. You still own the brand. So he continued selling in Indonesia and had a shock of his life when he received a cease and desist letter telling him that this is my brand. Please stop selling your products in Indonesia. And that shock was, wait a minute, this is my brand. How can I get a cease and desist letter for my ex-distributor telling me to stop selling in Indonesia? And that's when uh, we had to sit down and strategize with this client. All right, so what can we do? In Indonesia, the, part, the person that goes to the intellectual property office first and files an application in Indonesia is the party that has the rights. It's very difficult to cancel uh, existing trademark registration in Indonesia. Because in Indonesia, first to file, the party that files the trademark first has better rights than the party that uses the trademark first. Whereas in other countries that follow the Commonwealth uh, jurisdiction, you've got Singapore, you've got Malaysia, you've got Hong Kong, all practice first to use has better rights than first to file. So in Indonesia, it's different. So we actually had to strategize with the client. What do we do? Should we actually go to court uh, and take, take um, action against this other party? Or should we rebrand? So we looked at what kind of goodwill and reputation he has built uh, over the past years. and what can we do? Should we rebrand or take him to court? It's going to be three, four years to cancel the trademark in Indonesia. And it's going to cost a lot of legal fees as well. 
For this specific matter, our client decided to rebrand. He said, you know what? It's okay. My goodwill and reputation is not that much yet. I'll rebrand instead of fighting this guy and wasting business expense. Money that could go into business expansion and investment into other areas of the business does not need to go for legal fees to fight this battle in court. Uh, so in this case, it's okay if the brand is not well known. But if you've built your brand in that market, it is very detrimental. You can't just rebrand. So how you could have avoided this? Very, very important. Actually, for all the businesses out there, very important to know your market, your coming up market that you want to venture into. Handle legal matters on your own. Never let your distributor or your franchisee to register your trademarks, your patents, or your designs. You always have to remember how intellectual property assets are like tangible assets. You will never ask someone, oh, buy this property for me in Indonesia or in Myanmar or in Thailand on my behalf. You'll never say that. You'll make sure the paperwork is handled by yourself. It's the same thing. Make sure the paperwork is handled by your team in KL, whichever, wherever your headquarters is. If it's in Singapore, handle it. Remember that intangible assets are as important as your tangible assets. Right, so it's a very typical scenario and I can't emphasize it enough because of the number of times clients come to us with this problem. So another case study is Starbucks. Um, and Zing Baku. So those in China might have heard about this. It's a very famous case and it happened in 2003. Uh, for those who don't know Mandarin, uh, I'm learning but still not that great. I'm still like a beginner. Xing means star. Xing means star and Baku is the phonetic pronunciation of box. So Xing Baku means star box. So you're looking at the logos in front of you right now, you've got green and then black in the background. You don't have that um, mermaid, but you, from afar, you will still think that Starbucks. There were 19 outlets of Xing Baku in Shanghai. So of course, Starbucks was upset. So Starbucks took an action and this was a huge landmark decision way back in 2003. The reason it was a landmark is for many years, um, as China grew in terms of strength, uh, courts in China were favoring local business owners. So a lot of decisions where foreign business owners were attacking local business owners for misuse of their intellectual property rights, local business owners will win in these cases. So when Starbucks won, it was a huge thing in the business world. It's like, wait a minute, a foreign direct investment can actually survive in China and they won. Uh, and they won 62,000 uh, US dollars in terms of damages. Not much because there was 19 outlets open, but it was still a huge and de a decision that they were extremely happy with. So in this case, what helped them, Starbucks, was that they filed the Chinese equivalent of their brand in China. The, and they, used, they attacked them with the Chinese brand, not just the word Starbucks. If they had used the English version, I, we don't know whether they would have won. It's tough because in China, they might have just wanted, have you protected the Chinese version of it? In most countries, even if you don't protect it, uh, the translated version or the translated rated version, your English brand should be allowed to fight against the translated version because there's still confusion in the marketplace. Uh, but in a lot of the countries, especially developing countries, it's safer to protect the translated version and the transliterated version, meaning the way it's pronounced uh, in that country, just to be safe in terms of when you need to use those rights to attack anyone who's misusing it, it's easier with just a legal letter going out saying that I'm the true owner of these rights. Please stop trespassing on my rights. So when you're going abroad, so if it's a country that doesn't speak English, you're looking at protecting the equivalent in their language. So how another thing to know about China is similar to Indonesia, they practice the first to file rule as opposed to the first to use rule, meaning the parties that have the rights, um, the party have stronger rights if they file their brand first as opposed to use the brand first. So these are examples of brands uh, on products, on F&B, on food, food products. You can see how they do co-branding. They have the Chinese version and the English version on the packaging. And then you can see how like this Coca-Cola and Fanta um, uh, marks that appear on these cans. They also try to keep the element of how their English marks look like, the feel of the English marks so that the branding is maintained. Budweiser has 
but is as their main mark and then in the side and the behind of it is the is is the but is in the side uh, is the chinese version so you can see some brands prefer to have the mandarin version right up front and some decided to maintain the english version then you've got brands that you can see where they place it you're looking at do they place it as the main brand or do they place it as a minor brand so nestle for example in this example they've placed the sizing of the word Nestle in Mandarin is the same as sizing of the word Nestle in English. But look at how they did KitKat. KitKat, the English version is bigger than the Mandarin version. It's very important to notice all of this, especially when you see big brands, because a lot of effort, branding and consultancy has been taken into consideration when they do their packaging. So if you are an SME, would you be able to afford that kind of consultancy before you actually market your product out? There's a lot of research into what kind of what the Chinese public prefer or even what the Chinese public prefer. And the second thing is what the brand owner prefers. What are they wanting to promote as a prominent brand to, rec to make sure that the people remember and recognize it? So these are all uh, relevant. So let's look at Wrigley's. Can you see how Wrigley's at the top is really small in font compared to the Chinese version? Whereas Double Mint is really large and uh, maintained in terms of size. So this is really interesting in terms of how you package your products in the country. And that actually brings me to the end of my presentation. It's really short and I really wanted to address Q&A that you may have. Uh, there are many case studies because we've been around for 21 years. Feel free to ask as many questions, uh, any concerns that you have. And if it's not confidential, share it in this forum and I will be happy to address them. So um, I'll pass this back to you, Rene. Hi everyone. Um, any questions for Geeta? Any questions, anyone? This is your chance, so don't be shy. If any questions, uh, feel free to um, ask Geeta. Anyone? You just have to unmute your mic. Mm -hmm. Hi, or if you, I have yes. a question. Sure. Hi, I'm Clement. Um, um, if Hong Kong business want to get into the field of um, franchise business in Malaysia, what should they aware of? Uh, what kind of uh, step before they enter into a market? So can you get some sure. advice for us? Yeah, sure, Clement. Uh, very good question. So for franchise business, uh, Malaysia is a regulated industry. So there is a franchise act that must be adhered to and all franchises must be registered under the franchise registry which is in the ministry in Putrajaya. So there's an application process and there's an approval process. If it's not registered uh, and the business continues and you introduce a franchise to Malaysia, there is a high risk of the officials taking um, uh, uh, what do you call it? imposing a penalty and the penalty is up to 500,000 ringgit Malaysia, um, which is, I think, uh, Hong Kong is double, I think, that Malaysian ringgit, right? So you're looking yeah, at, right. yeah. yeah, so it's 1 million Hong Kong dollars as a penalty. Um, so, and, and the other thing is what we find, and we get a lot of cases where people want to register their franchise when, when a franchisee or a licensee, so a lot of businesses to call themselves licensees because they don't register a franchise. They think that calling themselves a licensee gets away from this act. The risk that they have is that, uh, the court doesn't recognize whether you call it a license or a franchise. They look at the business arrangement. If it's the business arrangement of a franchise where you're not only using intellectual property rights, but you're using all the SOP, the entire st uh, standard operating procedure is replicated, which is a franchise, then you're caught under the act. And if you don't have it registered, that means that agreement that you have, that license agreement or franchise agreement or whatever you call it, that agreement is void. So a lot of licensees, uh, uh, kind of get away with not following the act, uh, not following the agreement because when the franchisor wants to enforce the agreement, the licensee then cheekily says, "But you're not registered. Take take me to court, and I will throw you out." So mm -hmm. the risk is very high when uh, a franchise enters Malaysia and doesn't get themselves registered. I hope that addresses your question in terms yes, of franchising um, in Malaysia. I I also read about the franchise act. Um, Actually, the Hong Kong business can apply before uh, entering the market. They have a kind of procedures, see whether your franchise can be approved to operate as a franchise. 
Is that right? Yes. That is, yes. Uh, and so franchise you, expertise are uh, uh, assisting the Hong Kong business get into the franchise before they actually practice in the franchise business. Yes. So foreign companies, as long as they also have a good track record in their country, can register as a foreign party, uh, as a franchise owner, and then appoint a local franchisee, and the local franchisee will also be registered under the Act. Is it difficult? Is most of the cases is a local franchisee or foreign? Is there any successful cases for franchise uh, business operating from outside of a Malaysian uh, Malaysia? Sorry, sorry, Clement, say that again. Uh, is there successful cases from overseas franchise uh, franchisee? Oh, yes, there's a lot. A lot of them apply for, for franchise first uh, at a high, because they have a high fear of tarni brand tarnishment. One is a penalty. So I think a lot of Malaysian companies sometimes uh, risk the penalty. But if your brand is well known, they'd be very worried about your brand being tarnished. The last thing they need is bad publicity in press. So you, there is a lot of foreign companies that register uh, their franchise before entering the Malaysian market. Okay, uh, I actually I'm putting a more concrete uh, scenario. If something like the Hong Kong French, Hong Kong fast fast food or fast food restaurant, what we call Hong Kong Hong Kong style cafe, or maybe mm -hmm. the beauty shop, they have may have a few shops, or maybe they have chain shops, and want to get into get into the Malaysia uh, franchise business. Is this case is also uh, viable or can be can be applied? So, so good question. So they have to identify whether uh, are they setting up a franchise, which means that they will come to Malaysia and appoint someone who runs their business on their own and replicate exactly what they do in Hong Kong, or are they entering Malaysia and just selling products to a distributor? So if you, because I'm saying that because when you talk about beauty products and cosmetic, it might be just be selling through the Guardian and selling through various channels. That's distribution. That's not a franchise. But if you're selling products and, and servicing clients, uh, cosmetic companies, it can be they still do facial, they still have services, and there is a specific procedure where they replicate the business, that's a franchise. And then it's still the same uh, requirement. Okay, thank you.